All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first uh, webinar in the newly restarted National 302D Restoring Our Impaired Water webinar series. We're really excited to be back and continuing the series with our webinar on the Recovery Potential Screening Tool. Um, we have a couple of great presenters today. Um, first, we're going to hear from Emily Sierra, Andy Sommer, and Kim Oldenborg, who will be talking about the Recovery Potential Screening Tool. And then we will have Tracy Aya and Rebecca Jasta from Connecticut to talk a little bit about how they use that tool in their prioritization process. But before we get to that, a little bit about NUIPIC. Um, so we're a regional commission that helps states of the Northeast preserve and advance water quality. With support from EPA, we've been running this webinar series since 2016 as part of our work to coordinate, develop, and conduct training programs that serve water quality professionals. As always, presentations in this series represent the views of the speaker and don't necessarily reflect any pick or EPA endorsement or position. A couple of Zoom reminders before we get started. Um, we're gonna ask that you please stay on mute throughout this presentation and keep your camera off. Um, if you have any questions, please throw those into the chat at any point. We're going to be holding questions until the end of both presentations. But if you have any that come up during the presentations, make sure that you post them in there. Um, and if you have any trouble with your audio, you can either try reconnecting or you can try your phone audio. After this presentation, we will be sending out a survey. We'll be posting that in the chat, and I will be sending that as a follow-up as well. We really appreciate your feedback on this webinar, as well as future topics that you'd like to see covered in this series. And on that note, if you'd like to propose a webinar, that would be awesome. Um, we're looking for some of these priority topics, including climate change, environmental justice, and any cross Clean Water Act program collaboration topics. Um, but if you have anything that you would like to present on, please feel free to send in an abstract. These can be pretty informal. We just want to see that you've thought through what you want to talk about. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at cbotello at newipic.org. This presentation is being recorded and will be put on our YouTube playlist after this presentation is done. Um, you can also go there and watch recordings of our past webinars. And before I turn it over to our presenters, I just want to go over a couple of things that are happening at NUIPIC. Um, first of all, we have the Clean Water Pod, which is a podcast that uh, we've started with Flip the Field, um, and it talks a lot about the Clean Water Act. The second episode is out now, and we talk about uh, water quality standards. We are also looking for nutrient-related success stories out of your 303D programs. If you would like to share one of your stories, um, please submit those to me before 1212. Um, we also have the uh, non-point source conference, which is looking for abstracts by December 2nd. For more information, please feel free to either reach out to me or visit our website. And with that, I will turn it over to our first presenters. Just get my screen up here. Looks good. <laughs> Let me try this one more time. Uh, thanks, everyone. There we go. Am I sounding good, Courtney? Yep, looks good. All right. Well, yeah, thanks, Courtney. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, yeah, good afternoon. So as Courtney mentioned, my name is Kim Oldenborg. and. I'm with the Cadmus Group and a part of the RPS team with EPA. So today I'll be taking us through um, how to use the recovery potential screening tool to support watershed planning and prioritization. And I'll be starting us off today with an overview of the RPS tool, and then I'll pass it to Andy for a demo of how to use the tool. 
So we'll begin by just reviewing the goals and history of the Recovery Potential Screening Tool, or RPS. So RPS was originally developed by EPA in 2006 to help states prioritize impaired waters for total maximum daily load development. However, its uses can be much broader than TMDL development. RPS can be thought of as a framework, meaning it's both a method and a tool that can be used to compare and prioritize watersheds for a variety of purposes. So for example, RPS has been used by other state and federal programs to prioritize watersheds for activities such as issuing grants to address non-point source pollution, issuing grants for wetland and riparian mitigation, or to prioritize water quality monitoring. So overall, R RPS can help organizations conduct strategic planning of various water-related restoration and protection activities. So now into some more detail about the RPS tool itself. The RPS tool actually comes in the form of an Excel file. And this file contains all the custom functions, menus, and data that are needed to run a screening to compare watersheds. And that picture below is just showing the main setup menu within the RPS tool. So these files are available for all 50 states and US territories. Each tool comes preloaded with watershed data that is needed to run the tool. The watershed data is summarized at the HUC 12 watershed scale and referred to as indicators. And the picture on the right shows the relative size of the HUC 12 watershed. The RPS tool files are updated every one to two years to incorporate new indicator data. And even though the tools come preloaded with all the indicator data you need, um, the tools can be readily customized to add new indicators or alternative watershed scales. And over the years, EPA has worked with over 40 states and territories to customize their RPS tools. So now we'll touch on those watershed indicators in a little more detail. So because RPS uses an indicator-based method to compare and prioritize watersheds, these indicators are a key part of the RPS process. Watershed indicators in RPS are measures of watershed attributes that are relevant to water quality restoration and protection. These indicators can be grouped into three broad categories, which are ecological, stressor, and social. So when running the RPS tool, the user would select the relevant indicators in each of these categories. And we'll now go over each of these three categories in a little more detail. So starting with ecological indicators. Ecological indicators describe the condition of aquatic ecosystems and related watershed characteristics. These can help users understand what building blocks are already in place to support restoration or protection. The examples listed here include the extent of natural land cover, the condition of aquatic life and habitat, or maintenance of natural flow regimes. The next category is stressor indicators. Stressor indicators describe risks to watershed and aquatic ecosystem health, and these are typically the focus of restoration and protection activities. So example of these are the amount of urban and agricultural land cover, point source dischargers, sea level rise, or estimates of pollutant loading. And the last category is social indicators. Social indicators can include a wide variety of community, programmatic, economic, or behavioral factors that influ influence watershed management approaches and planning. This includes resources or drinking water sources that can help motivate stakeholder involvement. There are also demographic indicators that could be helpful for considering disadvantages, disadvantaged communities or environmental justice when doing a screening. So an RPS screening, screening typically includes multiple indicators in each of these three categories. To help distill that data down into a more manageable set of results, indicators are averaged into an ecological index score, 
a stressor index score, and a social index score for each watershed. The tool also reports an overall score known as the Recovery Potential Integrated Index for each watershed. And this index summarizes all of the indicator data for that watershed into a single number. And this can also be helpful for users when trying to compare and prioritize watersheds. So after completing, completing an RPS screening, results can be viewed in a variety of ways. And you'll see these different options in more detail with Andy's demo, but I'll talk through some of the kind of basics here. So the first way you can review results is in a table, and this shows the rank-based scores for all indicators and index scores for each watershed. The next way you can visualize results is actually using a map. And the results of any index score or indicator can be displayed on the map. So this is helpful to help identify geographic in your results. And then lastly, you can also review results in a bubble plot. And uh, the bubble plot contains one bubble for each watershed in your screening. So stress on the horizontal x-axis, and then ecological index scores are plotted on the vertical y-axis. The social index is plotted as the bubble size. So the larger bubbles have a higher index score relative to the smaller bubbles. So to help put re these results into context, there's actually a second set of axes at the median ecological and median stressor index values. And this helps split up the plot into the four quadrants that you're seeing. And these quadrants are actually useful for observing basic differences among the watersheds. So in the upper left quadrant, these are watersheds that are in relatively good condition with lower stressor levels. And these are watersheds that may be more responsive to restoration or protection activities. And then moving to the upper right, um, these are watersheds that are still in relatively good condition, but are possibly somewhat more threatened. And then down into the lower right, these watersheds have lower ecological scores and higher stressor scores. So these watersheds represent places where there's an opportunity for a stressor reduction. And then lastly, watersheds in the lower left um, these have low ecological and low stressor scores. And this means that they might be degraded by factors that were not included in the screening, and they may take a little more uh, investigation of what's going on. So overall, um, considering watershed placement along the X and Y axes along with the bubble size can be a really good place to start if you're trying to sort through and prioritize uh, watersheds. So that actually wraps up the overview portion of this presentation. And as Courtney said, we'll be happy to take questions at the end. Um, so thanks everyone. And I'll pass it off to Andy now to continue with the demo. Thank you, Kim. Um, <clears throat> hey, good afternoon, everyone. This is Andy Solmore from the Cadmus Group. Um, I am a hydrologist and I have been um, working as a contractor with EPA on um, all things RPS for about the last 10 years. Um, so before diving into the, the demo of the, the RPS tool, I'd like to begin just by briefly introducing the main steps in the RPS screening process. Um, so the process starts by first defining a screening objective, and this establishes the purpose of the screening and kind of the desired insight that you'd like to gain uh, by using the tool. And the next step is then selecting the watersheds and indicators that will be included in the screening. Um, these decisions are based on the screening objective that's, that's identified in step one, along with other factors um, like your geographic area of interest or program specific strategies or for priority setting. Um, and after selecting HUC-12s 12, uh, HUC and indicators, users then run one or more screenings, review results, and, and document their findings. And that middle step of running a screening is often repeated over several different iterations. 
So an, an initial screening might fit your needs exactly, but more likely it'll spur ideas for fine tuning by adding or removing indicators or hucks. And so in these cases, users would rerun additional screenings until an, an optimal option is found. So to set the scene for our demo, um, I'm going to be working in the fictional 51st state of the US, the island state of paradise. Uh, the Paradise Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, is prioritizing Huck 12s for TMDL development and implementation over the next decade. Um, DEP has decided to focus on TMDLs for nutrient-related impairments uh, for this round of prioritization. And, uh, has an initiative to factor environmental justice and equity into their planning decisions. Uh, to help guide the effort, DEP has decided to use the RPS tool to identify potential priority HUC 12s for TMDL development. Um, and then kind of a more in-depth evaluation of issues and needs could then be completed in those priority HUC 12s identified from, from RPS. So again, the RPS screening begins by defining a screening objective. Um, when first learning how to use the tool, it's okay to open it up and kind of run through, run through a screening without much uh, planning or forethought. But after you're comfortable with the data and the interface, we recommend defining uh, the objective statement to clearly establish why you're using the tool. Um, so displayed here is the screening objective for this demo to identify target HUC-12s for nutrient TMDL development and implementation to support ecosystem and community resilience. Uh, this statement clearly identifies HUC-12s as the watershed scale of interest, uh, nutrients as a specific impairment cause of interest, and ecosystem and community resilience as important factors for the analysis. Uh, then the next step is deciding which HUC-12s and indicators to include in a screening. Uh, for this demo, I'm going to look at HUC-12 subwatersheds in Paradise with at least one water body that's listed as impaired for nutrients or a related cause like excess algal growth or, or low dissolved oxygen. Uh, within the RPS tool, users can screen all HUC-12s in a state or just a subset of HUC-12s that meet user-defined selection criteria like the, the presence of impaired waters. Uh, for indicator selection, the RPS tool files have around 300 indicators that are preloaded uh, for screening. Uh, and a, a screening typically only uses around five to 20 indicators total. Um, so you have to kind of narrow that, that down list of 300 down to uh, just a much smaller group that you'd like to include. And we know that process can be uh, daunting, especially for new users um, to kind of decide which indicators are most relevant to them. Uh, so one ap approach I, I like to use is to write out a description of the preferred characteristics of a priority HUC-12 uh, for your effort. Uh, so in other words, what does kind of the ideal or target HUC-12 look like where you'd like to focus your time and resources? Um, and listed on this slide are three characteristics of priority HUC-12s that I'd like to target for this example screening. First, I'd like to choose HUCs that contain uh, communities which are potentially underserved. Second, the priority HUCs should contain uh, nutrient sources and excess loading that can be addressed through TMDL development and implementation. And third, the selected HUCs should be in relatively good condition compared to other candidate HUCs, meaning that DEP would like to focus on uh, HUCs that are more moderately impacted during this round of planning. So with that in mind, I'm going to open up the RPS tool file for Paradise. Uh, this is preloaded with indicator data for all HUC-12 subwatersheds in the state. Um, and the tool does include information on indicators to help uh, translate narrative uh, statements on kind of those preferred characteristics of priority HUCs into indicator selections. Um, so here I'm on the indicator info tab of the tool, and this stores um, a list of the names of all indicators that are preloaded in the tool, um, definitions, and, and data sources. And so this list can be filtered by um, category, indicator category, and by subcategory to help hone in on indicators that are related to a specific topic. This slide shows indicators in the Paradise tool that align with my list of pre preferred HUC-12 characteristics for the screening. Um, all of these indicators are available in RPS tool files for low, lower 48 states. Um, 
So my interest in potentially underserved communities is going to be captured with four indicators of demographic characteristics of a HUC-12. And these are based on uh, US Census Bureau data. So this is uh, the percent of the HUC-12 population that's classified as low income, uh, percent of the population with less than high school ed education, uh, percent that is linguistically isolated and percentage in vulnerable age groups. Uh, the statement on nutrient sources and loading led me to two stressor indicators, annual nitrogen yield and annual phosphorus yield from the HUC-12. Uh, these two indicators are derived from USGS Sparrow models. We compiled the results of the most recent set of uh, regional Sparrow models that USGS has, has produced to summarize model values per HUC-12. Um, and these measures measure nutrient yields or loads per square kilometer that or originate from pollutant sources within each HUC-12. And finally, the statement on overall watershed health is going to be reflected with uh, the watershed health index. Um, the watershed health index was developed by the EPA Healthy Watersheds Program as part of a, an analysis called the PHWA, the Preliminary uh, Watershed Health Assessment. And the Watershed Health Index is kind of a, a pre-canned um, uh, in, index of overall watershed condition that combines 20 different indicators, uh, which are related to different aspects of watershed health into one overall value per HUC-12. So again, for this demo, I'm only going to screen HUC-12s that contain at least one nutrient impairment. Um, shown here is a map of the number of water body assessment units throughout Paradise with nutrient-related impairments. Um, in the RPS tool, I'm going to start by creating a list of the green HUCs, those with at least one impairment, using the subsetting menu. So I'll move over to the HUC subsets tab of the tool um, and click the create a new watershed subset button. Um, now this launches a subsetting menu where users define selection criteria for a HUC-12 subset. So first I'll enter the subset name, um, in this case just nutrient impaired. Um, next I choose which indicator will be used to define the subset. The indicator that I want is in the stressor cat category and the water quality impairments subcategory and is named uh, Nutrient Impaired Assessment Units Count. So I can then highlight the values that I want to include in my subset. In this case, I'm including all counts except for uh, zero assessment units. Um, I then click the Add Condition, Add condition button. Um, and I'm able to, to combine up to 10 different selection criteria on this menu. To, huck, to subset HUC-12s based on multiple different attributes. Uh, but here I'm only using this one condition about um, presence of a nutrient impairment. And so I'm going to add, click the add subset to HUC subset sheet button. Um, and now my, my list of HUC-12s that have at least one nutrient related impairment um, is stored on this, on this sheet. So I'll now, now go over to the setup tab and this is where I uh, configure a screening by entering HUC-12 IDs and indicator selections. So in the select watershed section, um, users can add HUC-12s using the built-in menus or they can copy and paste a list of HUC-12 IDs uh, right into the tool. Um, so I'm going to click select watersheds and then I'd like to use the option to select a named subset from the subset sheet. Um, and I'm going to choose my nutrient impaired subset um, and then click add selected subset. Um, and that list of HUC-12s is automatically transferred over from the subset sheet onto the setup sheet. Um, next to the select watershed section are three different sections for choosing indicators. Um, again, there are built-in menus for um, selecting indicators from a pick list, um, or you can uh, type in or, or copy and paste in uh, the indicator names that you'd like to include. So I'm going to click, uh, just as an example, the select stressor indicators button. And you can see this launches a pop-up menu with a list of all stressor indicators available in the tool. Um, by default, all stressor indicators are displaying, um, but you can filter this list by uh, subcategory 
from the, the drop down menu. Um, and you can also double click within this menu on any indicator name to get a reminder of the description and the data source for the indicator. So I've already uh, entered indicators for my screening onto the setup sheet here. Um, you know, so in the ecological section, I have the watershed health index. In the stressor section, I have uh, nitrogen and phosphorus yields. And then in the social section, I have the four demographic indicators that I'd like to include. Um, you can see that each indicator on the setup sheet uh, also has a numeric weight value assigned to it. Um, by default, indicators are equally weighted um, and set to one, but users can adjust the weights by typing in a different number on the sheet. Um, indicators with higher weights will have a greater influence on the index score for the category compared to indicators with low weights in that category. So for example, setting the weight for nitrogen yield to two would result in nitrogen yield having double the influence on the stressor index compared to phosphorus yield. Um, weights can be used to reduce the effects of kind of overlap or redundancy between indicators. Uh, for example, if I included three stressor indicators in the screening that were just relevant to nitrogen only, then I might consider weighting those lower so that stressor index scores aren't biased toward Hux with nitrogen issues versus phosphorus issues. Um, weights could also reflect kind of program preferences in certain indicators or confidence levels in indicator data. Um, so I now have my Huck 12 selected along with my indicator selected. Um, so I will click the run screening button. Uh, when I do this, the tool is automatically calculating uh, index scores and ranks and fills out the results worksheets. Um, so I'm going to start reviewing results over on the Huck 12 map sheet. Um, this tab lets you create a map of any indicator or index in the tool. Um, mapped here is the stressor index, which combines our two stressor indicators, nitrogen and phosphorus yields, into an overall average score per huck. Um, darker blues would represent areas with higher values of the two stressor indicators. And so here we can see that high nutrient yields are kind of dispersed across the island. Um, on this worksheet, users have the ability to map any indicator, regardless of whether it was included in the screening or not. Um, so here I have copied uh, two maps of indicators that were not selected for the screening, impervious cover and cropland cover, as an example of how the maps can be used to review potential pollutant sources or other HUC-12 characteristics. Um, in these examples, we see that the northern HUCs tend to have high impervious cover uh, more dense development, and while cropland cover is generally higher in the, the south and west coast portion of the island. Um, here's a map of watershed health index scores, which, are, which is our ecological indicator for this demo. Um, as a reminder, the watershed health index is available in our RPS tools for all lower 48 states, um, and this combines 20 different indicators, which reflect the six attributes listed in the graphic on the bottom right part of this slide. Um, for those interested in more details about the Watershed Health Index, um, you can find more information on the Healthy Watersheds Program website, epa.gov slash hwp. And here are maps of the four social indicators used for the screening. Uh, darker blue shades correspond to HUCs with higher proportions of those groups typically associated with vulnerable or underserved communities. Um, so we see highest levels of those populations kind of clustered in Northern hucks, but there are some dense pockets of potential underserved communities showing up in, in the South as well. Um, and so overall, these maps are a good start, starting point for viewing indicator data and screening results. Um, after reviewing the maps, you can move over to the bubble plot and the results tabs to help make and, and finalize priority HUC-12 selections. Uh, the bubble plot tab displays uh, as Kim described, this displays all three index scores um, kind of in one place. Um, so the ecological index is displayed on the, the vertical y-axis. Uh, the, the stressor index is displayed on the x-axis. Um, and social index scores are displayed using the size of the bubbles. Um, 
So the bubble plot can be used to pinpoint priorities by identifying bubbles that kind of fit the profile of Huck 2 elves that users would like to prioritize. Uh, for example, in this demo, uh, remember that our preferred characteristics of variety hucks began with the presence of potentially underserved communities. So Huck 2 elves with high social index scores, uh, larger bubbles uh, are preferred. Also on the list of preferred characteristics was elevated nutrient loading. So I'm also looking for bubbles kind of on the right side of the plot that have higher stressor index scores. Um, and I can further refine that group just to the top right side of the plot since the list of preferred characteristics also included higher overall watershed health relative to other hucks and the upper half of the plot contains those hucks with high ecological index scores. Uh, so I can see that this screening in particular has several bu bubbles in the upper right portion of the plot that also have, have large bubble sizes indicating social index scores. Um, and I can identify this group of Huck 12s over on the results tab. The results tab contains a table of index scores and indicator values for the screened Hucks. Um, Excel's built-in sorting and filtering menus can be used to identify Hucks that fall within a target range of, of index scores. So I will filter this um, using the social index column first to only show hucks with above average social index scores. Um, then also filter the stressor index column to show hucks with above average stressor index scores. And then finally uh, filter the e ecological index column to only show hucks with above average ecological index scores. And this leaves me with seven Huck 12s that meet uh, all three of those con conditions. If I want to just verify where those Hucks fall on the bubble plot, I can go over to the bubble plot options uh, tab and click the highlight bubbles button and then select the option to highlight uh, bubbles, highlight watersheds uh, that have been filtered on the result sheet. Uh, and here I see that all seven Hucks are indeed located on the top right quadrant of the plot. And keep in mind that this, this top right portion of the plot uh, is the focus of this demo, but any quadrant in theory could be considered um, as a priority depending on specific needs and interests of the user. So pictured here are the seven hucks with above average ecological stressor and social index scores. Um, I'm going to designate these seven as priorities uh, from this screening. If this were a real world screening, I'd kind of give these results a re reality check with my own knowledge of Huck 12 conditions and also share these results with my colleagues for feedback. Um, I could also run additional screenings to refine the list of priority Huck 12s. So, for example, adding stressor indicators that reflect specific nutrient sources of interest uh, could be done to help target Hucks with those sources. I could also incorporate external data or additional information to, to refine priorities. Um, for example, if certain Huck 12s experience um, frequent harmful algal, algal blooms, then I could add a custom HABS indicator and include that custom indicator in a follow-up screening. So here I'm on the Add Indicators tab of the tool, and I've already entered kind of example data for an indicator of beach closures, closures due to algae blooms per Huck. Um, I can add this new indicator into the tool by clicking the Add Indicators button, uh, kind of verifying that um, these, this, these instructions um, were met for adding new data and clicking Yes. Um, and the new indicator is now uh, added to the kind of master data table for the tool um, and is available for uh, screening and selection from all of the different menus in the tool. So I will now pass it over to Emily Sira at EPA uh, to discuss some real world examples of how the RPS tool has been used for planning. All right, thank you, Andy. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. My name is Emily. I'm with the 303D program at EPA and part of my role is providing support for the recovery potential screening tool. So I wanna take a few minutes to talk through a few real world examples of the tool before passing it over to Connecticut. Uh, one example is from New Jersey, and it's the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. And the New Jersey DEP has used RPS to determine restoration priorities as part of their 2018-2020 integrated report. 
in New Jersey, DEP used a customized RPS tool. They customized the scale of the tool. Instead of using a HUC 14 scale, they used a, instead of using a HUC 12 scale, they used a HUC 14 scale, which is the scale that the state uses um, as planning units for water quality assessment, restoration and protection. And it's the scale that New Jersey uses as part of their integrated report. New Jersey DEP also added their own state specific data to the tool as well. The tool was used as part of a two-step process with the goal of identifying assessment units that show the best potential to achieve water quality improvements in order to maximize the use of funding. And I'll walk through an example of that process here shown on the right-hand side. Um, we have the upper Delaware region of New Jersey highlighted. And New Jersey DEP run the RPS tool and produced the, uh, the output on the top right. And after fact checking the output to make sure it made sense, New Jersey DEP combined that output with a comprehensive assessment of that region, which brought in additional considerations like localized impacts and upstream water quality uh, and produced the final output on the lower right hand corner. New Jersey is working to use the tool again for their next integrated report and is also including environmental justice considerations in water quality planning. Can you move over to the next slide, Andy? The second example I'll talk through comes from Wisconsin and from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. And Wisconsin DNR's Healthy Watersheds, High Quality Waters Initiative used RPS to model and identify the healthiest watersheds in the state in order to enable uh, protection and uh, prioritization for protection. This process is described in an action plan that was released earlier this year. And the action plan is an aspirational roadmap describing the steps needed to keep 100% of the healthy watersheds and high quality waters in the state protected through 2030. It is a result of a multi-year modeling and assessment effort, which included RPS as well as engaging and in incorporating input from multiple other partners. For this initiative, um, Wisconsin DNR adapted the RPS tool and kind of how they communicated it they refer to it as the protection potential screening tool. And on the right hand side, um, I'm showing the different examples of how they communicated the indicators. The ecological index in the tool was used to represent ecological health. The stressor index of the tool was used to uh, focus on vulnerability, which looked at long term trends in land cover and development and also climate change. The social index of the tool was used to reflect protection opportunities. So this might include an area with um, the known watershed group or known priority areas. And then overall, the recovery potential integrated index was referred to as the protection, was referred to as protection potential. So next I wanna talk through um, highlight how recovery potential screening could be used to support the 303D program vision. And the vision statement is shown here, but basically it's a framework to strategically organize and coordinate 303D program activities and achieve water quality goals. The initial long-term vision was released in 2013, and the themes of that initial vision were recently renewed with the 2022 long-term 10-year vision. A foundational goal of both the 2013 and 2022 vision is centered around planning and prioritization, encouraging a systematic prioritization of waters or watersheds for restoration and or protection. And the thought is here that states, territories, or authorized tribes would identify priority areas or themes to focus on. This might be a geographic area, it might be a specific pollutant, and they would have an approach for putting these themes together for prioritization of waters. And that information would be described in a prioritization framework document. RPS was used by a number of states for priority prioritization frameworks in 2013. And we think it may be used to support frameworks again for 2022. I just turned my volume up. I'm hoping that is helping out the situation. I guess I'll pause for a second to make sure. Okay. Um, Andy, you can go to the next slide. Okay, 
So a bit of detail about how, how RPS was used in 2013. Uh, RPS was used in combination with other steps and considerations. Uh, it, so sometimes used as a pri primary screening where staff may have been brought in afterwards to help sort through the results. RPS tools were customized by states to include state-specific indicators. And indicators used in the tool for the screenings uh, covered a range of themes. I highlighted a number of them here. Uh, example, ecological, stressor, and social themes. Moving forward for the 2022 vision, uh, the prioritization frameworks are to be shared with EPA by April 1st of 2024. And I, we encourage consideration of using uh, recovery potential screening or the watershed index online uh, to help with these prioritization frameworks. If you'd like to learn more, please, please reach out. Next slide. And lastly, I just wanna highlight a number of the resources we have to support recovery potential screening and also um, the watershed index online. And we didn't talk much about the watershed index online here. <laughs> We didn't talk much about the watershed index online here, but um, all of the indicators in the recovery potential screening tools come from the watershed index online data library, which can be accessed independently if you want to use the indicators for a separate use. There's also um, user guides available online, a video YouTube training series. We have reports from past projects. We have a number of indicator reference sheets that talk through some indicators in the tool, as well as scenario fact sheets that uh, can talk through use of the recovery potential screening tool for various purposes. And we have a web service guide. And I do wanna highlight that we can provide technical support. So if you would like to learn more, or interested in maybe um, using RPS moving forward to please reach out. I have our team email listed here and uh, the link to the RPS website on the bottom as well. And so that, I'll pass it back to you, Courtney. Thank you so much. Um, and again, uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the chat, but we will be holding on to those until the end of both presentations. Um, so thank you again, and I will pass it over to Rebecca and Tracy. Hi, thank you, Courtney. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you and we can see your slides. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Rebecca Jascott and I work in the Bureau of Water Protection and Land Reuse in the Water Quality Section at the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. And I'm going to give you a brief idea of how we used the RPS tool uh, in Connecticut to prioritize our watersheds for plan development. So um, as Emily uh, was discussing, we all know in uh, vision one, uh, states shifted their focus to develop 303D plans um, to be inclusive of our data and goals and created a bridge um, between those data and goals and implementation. So under the Vision One approach, Connecticut initiated the Integrated Water Resource Management Process, or IWRM, and we, we requested internal and external input from both the agency as well as the public to implement prioritization goals. So over a year, planning went into this phase um, with the internal and external uh, outreach and communication and it was broad and extensive. And so the message was that Connecticut was gonna be focusing on developing appropriate plans to re restore or protect uh, water bodies and that we were shifting away from focusing solely on, a, on TMDL development as a restoration plan approach. Although we were still committed to TMDL development, um, we were just going to enhance our toolbox to develop water quality plans. So Connecticut presented the IWRM and RPS tool concepts at various conferences and universities, 
and we integrated public input with assessment information, federal requirements, and stakeholder development. Um, and the re resulting focus areas for restoration and protection uh, were coastal embayments, swimming and fishing areas, nutrients, fish and wildlife, and stormwater. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now that we decided where we were going to, um, uh, what we were going to focus our efforts on, we needed to, to decide where we were going to focus these efforts and also who could we partner with. So Connecticut decided to utilize the recovery potential tool to help evaluate where we should develop plans within the five focus areas. So we reviewed all of the indicators that the tool came preloaded with from EPA and we developed a work group to help us make some decisions and choices about which indicators we wanted to use. So to enhance the RPS tool, Connecticut developed over 80 state-specific indicators, and we converted them to a numeric output. For example, we calculated the percent of natural diversity area, uh, streamline, uh, stream mile length where there was trout stocking present, and the number of toxic discharge uh, permits, to name a few. Um, so we under, underwent lots of geoprocessing, lots of data inputs from other DEEP programs, lots of calls with EPA, Andy specifically, I remember being on uh, lots of calls with you, um, and then all of those Connecticut-specific indicators were loaded into the tool. So once we had aggregated and geoprocessed and evaluated indicators, we began exploring the functionality of the tool. And as Kim and, and Andy mentioned early on, we learned very quickly that the weighting of indicators was critical. Uh, so we took a lot of time in, uh, to adjust the weights for each indicator within a category, and we produ produced a total of six scenario runs. So we had three runs for restoration, and three runs for protection for each of our focus areas. And because there were so many indicator options, Connecticut decided to use a core set of standardized indicators for protection scenarios, and then a second core set of indicators for restoration scenarios. So we then adjusted specific indicators in each category based on each of the focus areas. And here we have some examples of the core indicators that um, were discussed earlier. And one is the lowest uh, weight range and three is the highest. So here's an example of what a general health protection uh, run looked like. In general, the ecological and social indicators were weighted heavier than the stress stressor indicators. Um, in the protection scenarios where uh, ecological ind indicators received a weight of three and stressor indicators received a weight of one. And same approach for restoration, but it was flipped. Now the stressor indicators received a heavier weight and ecological ind indicators received a lower weight, uh, which all seemed to make a lot of sense, um, but the results were indicating obvious suspects to us, um, particularly for the restoration runs. Uh, for instance, we knew that, that the Quinnipiac watershed in New Haven was probably going to be at the top of the list as a stressed watershed. So we needed to figure out how we could manipulate the tool to find uh, a sweet spot, so to speak, to focus our resources and efforts. Um, so we decided to develop a tiered decision matrix. And this basically meant sorting and filtering the results by each RPS category for each of the three protection and restoration scenarios. Um, so this resulted in three top 40 watershed lists for both protection and restoration. So this is a protection example here that we started with 185 watersheds. We sorted those by the stress, stressor category from smallest to largest and that resulted in watersheds with the least stressors. We, uh, that reduced our list to 125 water watersheds, uh, which we then sorted by the social category, which was that category with recreational benefits or completed TMDLs, 
and that resulted in 75 watersheds, which we then sorted once again uh, by the ecological indicators, and that gave us 40 watersheds. And then we did a final sort by that um, recovery uh, potential index score. So taking into consideration all of those categories. Um, and we repeated this for all three scenarios that I talked about earlier. Um, we com completed a similar process for restorations, but we, we just, we still had too many watersheds. So we had to refine this list even further. So instead of the top 40, we decided to take the top 20 watersheds from each scenario list for protection. And in order to make it on the priority list, the watershed had to be listed in the top 20 for protection in all three of the scenarios. So this developed a list of watershed for even further review. So essentially the RPS tool gave us a good starting point and it could be justified, it could be replicated and documented. And it also allowed us to identify internally and externally that we weren't just picking random places on a map to develop plans. And it served as a really good communication tool for public engagement. It was easy to use, um, it was you know, Excel-based, systematic, repeatable, unbiased but we still had other things that we needed to consider. So one of the issues that we had in Connecticut was that we couldn't utilize the tool for coastal areas or embayments. So we had to sort of look outside of the RPS tool um, and we started to look at where other work was being done. So there was um, eutrophication modeling work um, taking place. Uh, we looked at the Department of Aquaculture work as well as other resources. And we really want to know where our partnerships were. So we looked at watershed groups, um, other ongoing projects, funding, staff resources. Um, and we also took into consideration where our staff was going to be. So we looked at the deep rotating uh, uh, basin monitoring schedule. So basically looking at all types of factors that the RPS tool couldn't necessarily account for. And so this is our, our map that is posted on, on our um, web page. And this is the final results for action plan development in Connecticut. We had good statewide coverage. Uh, we chose upland watersheds where uh, we chose embayments. Uh, and we, you know, we're still working on uh, bacteria TMDLs as well. So this is what our, our current universe looks like now. Um, we, we've tweaked a, a slightly some, some of our commitments, uh, mostly due to staff resources. Um, we lost a lot of staff, we had retirements, and we had some staff members move on to other things. Um, but the, the watersheds that were chosen for Vision 1 using the RPS tool have remained on the priority list throughout the process. So we have protection plans happening, alternative restoration plans happening. We have nutrient TMDLs, um, embayment modeling pl plans, and of course, still working on bacteria TMDLs. So just an overview for what worked for Connecticut. It was again, easy to use, systematic uh, as an unbiased method. We were able to load state specific indicators. Um, we used a weighted approach, and it worked as a good communication tool. Um, some of the cons that we had in Connecticut, so this tool obviously operates on a HUP-12 scale, but in Connecticut, we have a different watershed scale. We have Connecticut-specific watersheds, so we had to basically convert and change all of our, our information into a HUP-12 scale, um, and that required a lot of geoprocessing efforts. Um, and it was, uh, as Andy mentioned, it's time consuming. You know, you have to play with your scenarios and your indicators and um, the sorting technique itself. Um, but also uh, a con is geoprocess <laughs> the geoprocessing of Connecticut specific indicators. So it is, is a pro and a con. Um, and again, it, it wasn't working or couldn't work for our embayments and estuaries. So, how will we use the RPS tool for Vision 2? So 
I think in Connecticut, a lot of work went into front loading this tool and it paved the way for us for vision two. Um, so we'll probably update our confer and confirm our focus areas. We'll identify uh, state specific ind indicators, which ones sh we should redo. Um, we'll probably have to hire interns to help with some of those geoprocessing efforts. Um, and we'll evaluate the updated EPA indicators. And um, like uh, I think it was Emily mentioned earlier, probably going to put a heavier focus on environmental justice and tribes. Um, we're going to look at upcoming conferences and trainings so that we can do another broad sweep of that communication and outreach, um, as well as coordinate with our watershed managers and the non-point source program. Um, and also evaluate huc 12s on a more refined scale. Um, so, you know, we, we can we can protect uh, local basins and restore local basins all in the same watershed. So we'll probably rerun the tool on a more refined scale. And so this is an example. Uh, we've started including the environmental justice components into our TMDLs. Um, so we're going to, obviously, we're going to address areas of environmental justice concern, distressed municipalities, uh, low income areas uh, in those census blocks, and um, just basically um, following up with what Emily said, put a heavier, um, heavier weight on those indicators that, uh, that are, are associated with environmental justice. So with that, I don't know, Tra uh, Tracy is my supervisor. I don't know, Tracy, if I missed anything that you think that you want to include, or I'll pass it back to Courtney. You know, Rebecca, you, you did a great job. You know, I think you gave a, a good overview. Um, it It is a very helpful tool. I do expect we will use it again, um, as Rebecca indicated, and... Um, Maybe this time we won't use all 80 indicators, but uh, we'll pick, we'll be strategic about what we do. So thank you. Thanks. And thank you, Rebecca, for that presentation. Um, so now's the time. If you have any questions, please start posting those in the chat. We did get a couple already. Um, So let me just find those very quickly. All right. So our first question is for Andy. Um, how do you determine nutrient impairment? Are there standards for your demo site? And I think we have you muted right now. Sorry about that. The impaired waters indicators that are in the tool, um, they are calculated from EPA's attains database. So in, um, I believe it was August of 2021, last year, we did a poll um, nationwide of, of all data in attains um, and kind of summarize things to um, impairment counts and impaired areas within a, uh, each HUC-12. And so, yeah, all of those numbers are from state through 3D lists, impaired waters lists, um, and, and coming from the Tains. Great. Um, and we have another question for you as well. Um, and this one is from Keenan. Uh, how how does the length of the impaired segments impact prioritization if they do? Yeah, so that's something that can be factored in as well. So in my demo, I just picked, um, uh, you know, presence of at least one impaired segment. But if you wanted to look at, um, you know, extent of impaired waters within HUCs and, and factor that in, there are... Um, other indicators in the tool that are measuring uh, kind of impairments and expressing impairments as a percent of the total HUC-12 area. Um, and that's again, based on, on data it attains. 
Thank you. Um, and this next question, I believe, was asked during um, one of the later presentations, but uh, this might be good for Andy as well. Um, so th this one is from Paul. It says this looks really good. Um, I'm missing the connection between a comprehensive ecological index, which reflects integrated uh, chemistry, physiology, and biology, um, to a single nutrient pressure. Um, what does a management plan or TMDL look like to achieve a bio-integrity target? Yeah, so that's a good question. And, and <clears throat> the ecological indicators that, that a user picks, um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's totally up to the user. So in, in my example, I, I, in ecological category, I use that, that integrated index. But if you wanted to, you know, if you're doing a nutrients-focused screening and you wanted to focus on um, just including ecological indicators that you thought were relevant to nutrient impairments and nutrient management, then, you know, you certainly could do that. Um, and then if you're kind of concerned about potential overlap between or codependence between ecological and stressor categories, again, there's, there's total flexibility in how you're setting up and using the tool. So you could, you know, you could, in theory, we have a one indicator that we, we include in each category is just like a, a dummy variable. So if, you know, if you just wanted to use, um, just stressor indicators. If you're concerned about that overlap between ecological and stressor, you can do that as well. Thank you. Um, this next question is for Kit. Um, was there any public input or objection on the final selection of prioritized watersheds? Yeah, so we were pleasantly surprised at the reaction from the public. We had um, a lot of people wanting us to come to their watershed to do work, um, but nothing that really sticks out to me that was um, object. There no object objections really. Um, I, I we were we were really happy that the public um, was so involved and gave us. Um, so much input. Yeah, this is Tracy. I'll just add that the people who were really interested also really wanted all the runs and all the documentation for how we we um, sorted and used the recovery potential tool, um, and and they dug through that in in detail. Um, so. Uh, we had a technical support document that provided that information. I put a link in the chat um, for folks, but the public public really liked it. And as, as Rebecca said, people wanted more waters to be added, and we had to go back and forth. We could add we could add a few, um, but we had to you know put some off for a later time. That's great. Um, and kind of talking about public outreach, I was wondering, um, is there anything that you would change about um, how you approach uh, that outreach for this second time around for Vision 2.0? For Connecticut, Courtney? Yep. Um, we, we haven't done our public out, outreach yet. And one thing that I, I, I had initially wanted to include in my presentation, but I was afraid it was going to be too long. We held a watershed fair, which was really interesting. And we, we had, um, this is before the, the world um, changed, but we, we had a venue and everyone, um, uh, environmental groups uh, came and set up, you know, stations with all of their information and the work that they were doing. Um, and it was a great brainstorming event. Uh, and I, I would like love to see something like that happen again. Um, although since the days of COVID, I don't know if that will be possible, but um, but that really helped with communication and outreach. And I think we'll we'll do another another broad. Um, a broad sweep to see to see a how we're doing and what people think about all the plans that we already have in place but b um, you know get some some new input and new feedback uh, that's awesome and that sounds like a really cool event yeah it was great I wish we could do well I hope we could do it again sometime <laughs> 
Um, so switching back to um, some of the broader RPS questions, um, this one is from Douglas. How often are data for the Excel sheets updated? Do we need to request new state specific sheets each update? Yeah, the, we've been releasing updates to each tool file um, once a year for the past three or four years, we've done those updates. Um, you know, in, in those cases, we're not updating every single indicator in the tool. We're kind of identifying a, a slug of high priority indicators that have, have undergone some kind of um, update to the, the original data that, that we use to calculate those. So like, for example, on um, the set of tools that we put out in late August of this year, um, all of those will have updated land cover indicators from the uh, 2019 version of the National Land Cover Database. Um, so yeah, about an annually. Um, and then in terms of requesting state-specific data, um, yes, please do reach out to uh, Emily Sira at EPA um, about support uh, for adding custom indicators into the tools. All right, we have another question about the ecological index. Um, so are uh, prospects for recovery realistic? Any success stories for biointegrity outcomes out there, um, especially given the global biointegrity crisis from climate change? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would, I would say that ultimately, um, you know, the kind of the, the restoration goals or protection goals um, that are that are driving the use of the RPS tool, you know, they may or may not be related to, you know, specifically restoring forest cover, um, you know, or along those lines. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it, it really, the, the goals of restoration, the goals of protection, are going to vary from, from user to user and be kind of specific to the, the program and initiative that, um, that the user is, is applying the, the outputs of the, the RPS tool for. And I'll add on to that a little bit uh, based on the New Jersey example that I talked about earlier. In New Jersey, you know, having a, a set amount of resources, they're trying to look for watersheds, they consider them to be like on the bubble. So they're looking for waters that might be, um, you know, restored or attaining water quality standards with relatively low effort compared to other watersheds. So that's how they uh, might be using that information to prioritize so they can get the biggest bang for their buck. Thank you. Hey, um, Courtney, it's Tracy. I'll just yep. jump in because I, I know Paul is particularly interested in the integrity and the um, the contributions or use of buffer areas in watersheds to um, help use nature to provide res restoration or protection for water quality. Um, and certainly the recovery potential tool works on a larger scale. So it doesn't in include the buffer area. But I think like what we had done where we, we looked at the larger scale water, you know, we looked at watershed scale to first evaluate, then we needed to do the next steps outside of the tool to add in additional analyses and, and consideration. So I, Paul, I, I, I don't think that, you know, the recovery potential tool can, can do everything. Um, and, and, but it's a good step at sorting a large, you know, watersheds on a state scale to, to get it down and then, and then look a little bit more in a more refined process um, at, some of the, the biointegrity concerns. Yeah, that's a good point, Tracy. Um, so uh, one more question we have kind of related to the broader RPS tool. Um, is there any way you can provide guidance on what indicator distribution or ranges are informative for decision making? Um, where can I find ultimate min max values for each indicator? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I'll share my screen again quickly. So the um, data tab of the RPS tool that stores the indicator data has an explore indicator data button. Um, and clicking that launches a menu where, um, you know, if you were interested in, in any of the indicators in the tool, um, you know, I'll, I'll just go with impervious cover in this example. Um, this menu will show you a histogram of the distribution of indicator values across all hucks uh, by default for all, for all hucks in the state, but you can, you can subset that to just look at a smaller group of hucks. And then summary statistics, so min, max, median, means, et cetera. Um, and then you can also look at correlations between two different indicators. So um, that can help with narrowing down indicator selections. Uh, you know, if you had a pair of indicators that you were considering in, in adding to your screening, um, but they had very high correlation statistics, then, you know, you could, in theory, drop one of those indicators and, and kind of still end up with the same amount of information within your screening. Um, and in terms of kind of recommendations on relevant minimum or, or maximum values, um, we do not have those at the moment. That would be a great kind of uh, dissertation level research project. Um, but that's, yeah, I mean, that's something that if, if you are interested in trying to tease those out, um, you know, you'd have to go through and comb through existing literature. Thanks. Um, and I've also, uh, we've posted the uh, link to the RPS tool in the chat as well. Um, I'm guessing there's some more documentation in there as well. Is that correct? Yep, that's right. Um, there are instructions for using that uh, explore data menu. Perfect. Um, so if anybody else has a question, feel free to throw that in the chat. Um, if you would like to talk through your question, if you want to raise your hand as well, that's also an option. All right, then if there are no additional questions, um, oh, looks like we got one in the chat. Um, yeah, a comment about the um, original question. Yeah, so so the units, I, th I think you mean the maybe the units of the values. And so um, those are described in the indicator info uh, descriptions tab. So each little paragraph summary of the indicator uh, notes the, the measurement units. All right. And um, so in the chat, we're going to post a link to that post meeting survey. Um, thank you again to all of our presenters for um, sharing this information with us. I know that I learned a lot today. Um, so thank you very much for joining.